Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Baumgartner. Uh, Baumgartner is an old German name that means ass farmer. <laughs> <laughs> old joke. <laughs> Jbum on uh, Twitter, uh, jbum.com, uh, crazydad.com if you like puzzles. And this is my talk about uh, round things. So um, I'm going to show a lot of recreational programming in this talk. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, I went to art school, CalArts, years ago. And, it's, and I've always been terrible in classrooms. I'm one of these people where the teacher says something interesting. And I start thinking about it. And then 20 minutes later, I realized they were still talking the whole time. And so I don't. I don't function well in classrooms, so I'm mostly self-taught with all this um, nonsense. Uh, but the way I taught myself was recreational programming. I love recreational programming. And what I mean by recreational programming is something you can do in 20 minutes. The idea is you get it done in 20 minutes, and then you spend two hours playing with it, making variations, seeing where it can take you. And so I've done a lot of recreational programming, and we're just going to really scratch the surface. Um, and I'm going to be showing you a just one specific aspect of it uh, tonight. I'm focusing on the round stuff. I've made a lot of round recreational programs for some reason. I've heard it said that the world is divided into triangle people, circle people, and square people. I don't know if that's true. I think it's probably like astrology. And I'm a Sagittarius, and Sagittarians don't believe in astrology. <laughs> but um, but let's just pretend this is true. So we'll say that the triangle people don't fit in well and probably like punk rock and angular and uh, and I don't know anything about square people except that the world seems to be made for them. Fucking ninety degree angles everywhere you look. But I am a round person. And uh, does anyone identify with one of these more than the other? Just show of hands if you identify as one of these. OK. Triangles? We've got a few. Cool. Uh, squares? Rectangles. <laughs> rectangles. We got some rectangles. Circles? We got any circles? OK, we got a few. So who knows? Maybe there's something to it. I don't know. I am definitely a circle person. Uh, as I said, we're just going to be scratching the surface. I've done a lot of circular stuff, and I, you know, can only fit so much in uh, tonight. But you'll see, uh, you'll see a bit of it. Uh, this is a, um, a mosaic I made from the squared circle group on Flickr years ago. Uh, and it's all photos of, of circular things. Did I mention I like circles? Um, because I'm a circle person, I get really annoyed whenever I see people's LED projects because they always look like fucking cubes. And I think the reason, or squares, or rectangles, and I think the reason they do is that people think that squares are easier. And maybe they are. I don't know. Um, this is my, was my first significant LED project. And as you can see, it's a square, so they must be easier. But I don't know. Um, anyway, there it is. Yeah. OK. So. What this is, put this up so people can see it, and then I'll put it back down, um, was I wrote a program that made a Fibonacci spiral and used it on a laser cutter to cut the Fibonacci spiral on a piece of acrylic, which you're looking at, and stuck lights through it. And then the, the um, the lights are being pulsed using something called incremental drift, which is essentially the same pattern you see here on this graduated um, Newton's cradle. And so the spokes that you're seeing appear um, are essentially similar to when you see concentric lines appear in, in, in this pattern here. And, and that's controlling the luminance of the lights. And it's about a five minute luminance cycle. And then uh, the hue and the saturation are being controlled by uh, sine waves that are not a multiple of each other, so you get a nice long cycle out of it. Um, so I'll put this down, and hopefully uh, 
Oh, can we turn the lights out, by the way? Because you guys have looked at me long enough, and the slides are pretty. OK. So we're getting ahead of ourselves here with all this Newton's cradle stuff. So I, I did want to have at least one slide that went back to basics. Um, if you, I'm insulting your intelligence, I apologize, but there's probably a few of you that have never actually written code to draw a circle. So I just want to explain how that works. Um, let's say you want to draw a bunch of points in a circular arrangement. So you have like 30 points or 100 points. So you make a loop that goes from 1 to 30 or 1 to 100. And you turn that loop index into an angle. And the angle goes from 0 to 2 pi or 0 to tau because tau is really the constant, and 2 pi is just tau divided by 2. But anyway, so tau divided by 30, or tau divided by 100 is your angle. And then r is the radius from the center of the circle. And then you plug them into these formulas, and that's your x, y. So what you're doing is you're converting polar coordinates, angle and radius, to Cartesian coordinates, x and y. OK? Um, now you can forget that. Uh, but I, I should point out that there are multiple ways of drawing a circle. And if you're interested, there's a really good article that was written by Jim Blinn, a computer graphics pioneer, called How Many Ways Can You Draw a Circle? that he wrote for uh, the IEEE Computer Graphics Journal uh, back in the 80s. And he describes 15 different ways. And it's really interesting. None of them are remotely useful, but they're really interesting. So check that out. Um, so this is a, my, my first example of recreational programming. I didn't actually make this. I found this on Reddit somewhere. There is a Reddit subgroup called, ooh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Uh, there's a Reddit subgroup called uh, Endless Loops, or Endless GIFs, or something like that. And I, I found it on there, and I thought, that's cool. Um, how did they make that? So let's see, they got all these interlinking circles. So you draw a bunch of circles using a 2D loop. And then each circle has an orbit going around it. There's one right there. And the orbits are out of phase with each other. And the phase of the orbits are being controlled by a horizontal sine wave and a vertical sine wave, I think. Let's try that. Not quite right. Let's change it up. OK, I eventually figured that one out. Um, so now what can we do with it? So the next thing I tried was uh, making the orbits uh, follow the, the path of a logarithmic spiral. We'll talk about logarithmic spirals in a bit. So that was cool. And uh, it's, I, I enjoy making endless loops. And the, and the trifecta is if you can make an endless loop that combines zooming, rotation, and translation all at the same time. That's, that's my favorite. It's hard, and it's hard to do. But So here's adding translation to it. And the cool thing is that if you follow any individual dot, it actually moves from circle to circle. This is actually looping fairly quickly. It's looping at like every three seconds or so. Where are we? Four seconds. You know, the, the, the orbit is, is the length of the, of the movie you're watching. But you can see that the, the individual dots are actually traveling across the screen. So that was fun to figure out. And then now, you know, 40 minutes have gone by. And then I'm like, you know, OK, enough spirals. Let's, what if I can? <laughs> What if I controlled the orbit with the color of an underlying picture? You, I assume you recognize the picture, yeah? Yeah, OK, everyone does. That's why I always use it. So um, that's cool. You know what, these circles in the background, you don't really need those. So let's get rid of those. You know what we need? We need, we need more dots. Um, no, more dots. OK, that's cool. Now what if we colored the dots with the color of the underlying image? Ooh, that's cool, but it's a little jerky. Why is it jerky? OK, so now I spend two hours figuring out why it's jerky. And then I get a slight improvement. Uh, OK, but we need more dots. And now I have something completely different just from following this thread of recreational programming. And, and I figured out a cool way to make a photo breathe, basically. And what happens is I always start with something that's very unsubtle. And then, at the, and then three hours later, I have something that you can barely tell it's moving. <laughs> that's called sophistication. Yeah. 
Sometimes I'm not even sure if it is moving because I've been looking at the thing that's not moving, and then when you look at the wall, the wall's like, ugh. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about logarithmic spirals. Logarithmic spirals are cool. Um, um, let's talk about how you draw a spiral. Remember how you draw a circle? You draw a bunch of dots with polar coordinates, and you have a radius and an angle. Well, if you just keep drawing circles and you change the radius, you get spirals. You know, you make the radius shrink, the spiral goes in. You make the radius grow, the spiral goes out. If the radius is changing linearly, you get a, a linear spiral, which looks like a lollipop or a coil of rope. Um, but if you make it change, um, uh, the, the change accelerate, um, specific, uh, you get a logarithmic spiral, sp specifically if you accelerate logarithmically. So you basically take that linear value you were using and you pass it to the log function and you get one of these, which um, I think my favorite example is that is the Nightmare Before Christmas spiral, which is uh, pretty close to it. And by the way, very hard to find pictures of Nautilus shells that aren't in cross-section and have a, a text about the golden mean. <laughs> you know, Nautilus shells do exist not cut in half. I'm just saying. Um, so this is an old, um, oh, I have to open the sketch. Anyway, we'll open the sketch now. Uh, this is an old uh, sketch of mine where I'm, I'm creating a logarithmic spiral effect by coloring the pixels according to uh, log r times some constant plus a, where a is the angle, c is the constant, which controls the twist of the spiral, and log r gives you the logarithmic spiral. And you pass up the sign, and you get an undulating sine wave that goes in a logarithmic spiral. So uh, please ignore the man behind the curtain while I actually show the thing I was intending to show. Yeah, it's okay. It'll, it'll come back. Um... There we go. Now the question is, is this going to actually show on the right window? So this is a shader. And, uh, oh, I think it doesn't like quick time. You know what? I'll try one more time and it's going to quit unexpectedly and then I'm not going to bother. All right. Okay, imagine an amazing uh, logarithmic spiral effect and then I'll continue. Um, just Close your eyes. Ooh. I was worried about that one because it changes the screen resolution. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. As soon as I... Okay. Uh, while we're talking about spirals, uh, I wanted to show this vortex maze um, I did uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I have a puzzle website that has mazes on it, and I've been trying to improve my mazes. My, the mazes that are currently on the site are, in my estimation, pretty crappy. But, um, but I like this one. I'm very happy with this one. So what this is is um, a very simple hexagonal maze that you can solve right now just by looking at it. And then I've replaced each hexagon with a spiral. <laughs> and the apertures in the walls are there's connections to the next room, and where there's a blockage in the wall, there's something like this where you can't get through. But the blockage isn't here, it's here, or here. Um, and the opening that connects to the wall has been twisted, which makes it much less obvious how to get around. And it's pretty, I think. Um, so I like those. Um, I don't know how many of those I can make and keep them interesting, but it's. It, now, just, just, just to be fair, this is where I started, <laughs> right? Um, I've been making mazes for a while. My first ones looked like this. Um, um, most computer-generated mazes are done on square grids. Um, they're not very interesting. Um, this is a, a more recent one where I've been playing with um, trying to make things a little more random. In this case, I'm using a uh, Fibonacci spiral again, like the lights. Um, as, the, uh, as the basis of the underlying grid. And then I've been playing with this idea for making them look a little more naturally drawn, where uh, I um, put a dot in, e in the center of each tile, triangle or square, and then connect those dots to create a new tessellation. And it, it creates um, far more um, uh, concave polygons 
so it looks like it's made of stones or pebbles. And then when you make a maze out of it and you draw them with Bezier curves, it, it, it gets a nice effect. So I'm getting there. And the other thing I figured out how to do, although it's very hard to see on this slide because of the color, but you'll notice that there's a, a slight blue tinge. Can you see that from where you're sitting? So that's the solution of this maze. And what I figured out how to do, turns out not to be that hard, thank goodness, uh, is um, determine the entryway and exit points for the longest possible solution. And it turns out to be a fairly, fairly simple. Um, if you imagine that the maze is basically has a bunch of pieces of strings going through it with knots at the intersections, you just pick the whole thing up and you find the lowest point and then you invert it and you dangle it from that and you find the other lowest point and those are the points. There's an algorithmic equivalent of that that visits each node just once, so it's quite fast to actually find it. I was thinking it was going to be brute force, you know, compare every possible thing, find the solution, check if it's longer than the last one, and it's not that. It's actually, you can find it fairly quickly, so that's good to know. Um, so a bit about Fibonacci spirals. Um, Fibonacci spirals are based on the golden angle. It's basically the golden angle uh, sorry, the golden mean, the golden mean times um, pi or 2 pi, depending on how you want to cut it. So this is the formula I had memorized, and it's just a magic formula, pi times 3 minus the square root of 5. This gives you this golden angle. You see it's gold. <laughs> That's how you know. You found the right one. And, um, and it appears, as, as you all have undoubtedly heard on Boing Boing and elsewhere, it, it appears... <laughs> Uh, and next to pictures of nautilus shells. Um, it appears in nature quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's a very common angle in plant phyllotaxy because it maximizes real estate. Um, so if you're trying to get the sun to reach as many leaves as possible, you, you use that when you're, when you're growing outwards and you get all your leaves, uh, get, get adequate sun. And it also packs circles very efficiently. Um, I've, I, I accidentally stumbled on an extension of it where you, where you can take a, a golden spiral, or Fibonacci spiral, and wrap it around a sphere. And uh, for any number of dots, you get an equidistant packing of dots on the sphere, and it's super simple. So if you have 100 dots, and their you know, i goes from 1 to 100, it's just i times the golden angle is the longitude of the dot. So that's that simple. And then blah, blah, blah is the latitude, and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that easy? Um, basically, what you're doing is you're subdividing the angle. Uh, that's, that's all that's doing by the number of dots or, of, of the latitude from minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees. That's, and that's how you do that. But uh, it's, 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 it's simple. Um, and the cool thing is you can take a sphere, you can take any number of LEDs, put them on your sphere and get them to go to the right place. So my next LED project is probably gonna be one of these. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, of course not. I have to actually click on the, that slide. Let's see if this works. Yay! Of course you can't see it, but boy, this looks great. Here we go. This is, a, this is an old site I made in Flash. It's now in uh, JavaScript. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to talk about JavaScript today. This is in JavaScript. <laughs> uh, you put in your zip code. Does anyone have a zip code? 90405. 90405. Let's try that. Uh, 90405. Uh, here we go. And then it shows all the local lunch places that have uh, good Yelp, uh, Yelp reviews and tells you which one to eat at. Uh, or, or this one says invite someone else because you, you clearly need more friends. Um, there we go. Ah! That was interesting. OK, let's see where we go. It was faster in Flash, honestly. <laughs> Up, Uplifter's Kitchen, whatever that is. Do you know what that is? Uh, OK.
Okay, so that's where you should eat. Um, very useful for resolving arguments with your colleagues. Um, that is the wheel of one. Okay, where were we? Uh, I'll just leave that up. My fan's already going off. Maybe I won't leave it up. So yeah, I ported that to um, uh, P5JS, which is the JavaScript port of processing. I've been through a lot of different flavors of processing, and a lot of the recreational programming I do is actually done in processing. Processing was originally a Java-based uh, programming language for artists and designers. Um, you can now program in processing in Python, JavaScript, Java. Um, I've done some stuff in processing JS in which you're still essentially programming in Java and it's converting it to JavaScript, but now I tend to use P5JS, which, um, where is my slideshow? There it is. Which, uh, um, is native JavaScript and you're programming in JavaScript and you're just using the processing graphics library and it's very nice. And the wheel of lunch kind of works in it. And I kind of had to port it because everyone's dropping Flash. I actually liked it better in Flash. It was a little more performant in Flash. Um, but uh, there are many browsers that simply, that Flash, Flash doesn't work in by default now, so I kind of have to drop it. Um, because I'm crazy about circles, wheelof.com has, uh, I didn't get wheelofunch.com, I got wheelof.com, so I could just tack words onto the end and then put different round things on it. So there's a bunch of, of interesting round things to see on that website. Um, this is the section of the talk where I skip past half my slides because we're nearly out of time. So I'll just say that uh, I was gonna do a bit about Don and James Whitney, who were experimental computer animators who invented motion control using World War II anti-aircraft equipment, and show a little bit of James Whitney's movies Lapis, which was done on that equipment in the mid 60s that uses nine-way radial symmetry and is very cool, and then talk about John uh, Whitney's book Digital Harmony, and the concept of incremental drift, which I got out of that book from a basic program in the back, and then um, talk about the Whitney music box, in which I use uh, an incremental drift system to play a music box. When the dots cross that line, you get music. It's great. Um, and uh, then I was going to show the Whitney music box, but we're going to skip that. And then I was just going to talk about my crazy obsession with music boxes and how I had a music box disc made that actually has the Whitney music box pattern on it that's designed to play on this music box that I can't afford. And... Uh, and then other music box things I made, like the Wheel of Stars, in which I revolved the entire sky full of stars past a line that causes them to play as notes. And um, Micrographia, in which I, and I brought that with me if you want to see it later, in which we use a microscope and look at small things and have them play music uh, using Max. And, um, and then uh, Kenneth Strickfadden, I found in this book, I was reading about Kenneth Strickfadden because I'm obsessed with him because he did the effects for Frankenstein, and done, right? And it turned out that he was in this old vaudeville show called Willard's Temple of Music that had all these crazy round music instruments, including a row of table saws in which young women would, uh, they would turn the lights out and young ladies would put blocks of wood against the table saws and they would make different pitches like <clears throat> and showers of sparks and he made this disc for it, it was called, uh, he called a Melodyne, and I was like, that's crazy, it looks just like my disc. What is he doing? So um, he would blow air through it, and it would make pitches, and it turns out that was kind of a thing back in the day, and there was an old article in Popular Science about how to make one, although that illustration is wrong, and uh, way wrong, um, and then in the 19th century, they used something very similar to teach music in schools, to teach how sound waves work. So I wrote a, a script that simulates the strict Fadden Melodyne and worked out that he's probably, this was probably a diatonic scale, or the white keys on a piano. So um, I have a JavaScript demo that allows you to just make one, and then it uses the JS PDF library to produce a PDF uh, on your machine, which I love, no server needed. And, uh, and then you can cut one on your laser cutter and uh, see what it sounds like. Probably sounds like crap, but it's a cool idea. Um, so, uh, as you can see, I have an interest in 
and mechanical devices and his and 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 forgotten pieces of technology. And uh, this this is one that fascinated me a few, a few years ago. I saw this on <coughs> excuse me. I saw this on uh, Kickstarter. It's called the Cycloid Drawing Machine, and it's a, a drawing device very similar to the Spirograph, but better. It does thing? I, I don't think a Spirograph can actually do some of these designs because um, it's not quite as complicated. Um, but the Spirograph is one of many mechanical drawing devices. Um, there have been many of them. Um, the cycloid drawing machine is probably most similar to, to this one. Um, but uh, there was a number of mechanical lathe devices that were used to make security designs on money in the 20th century. So like very intricate rosettes, things like that. Um, that were hard for people to duplicate. Um, so I looked at this, and it looked pretty cool. Um, so I ordered one, and then I got impatient. So I looked at um, <laughs> some of the illustrations and attempted to simulate it, and I was able to get pretty close in about 20 minutes. Um, that was probably longer than 20 minutes, actually, by the time we took a screenshot. But, but I was able to get pretty close to the illustration, but it wasn't quite close enough. So um, I wrote to Joe, who made it, and I was kind of worried he was going to be pissed off because he was selling these things for a lot of money. <laughs> and I was basically proposing, I want to make an exact simulation of it that's free for everybody. Uh, and he was okay with it, so that was good. And uh, he, he actually sent me a free one, which was great. So now I have two of them. And he sent me the plans, and I made one. And, uh, and it was cool because it, um, the simulation, you can run much faster. and um, it, uh, there it is, and um, again, let's see if we can actually look at the real thing. Again, pardon me if uh, the browser crashes. We'll see what happens. Oh, I did it again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that'll work. Okay, so this is the real thing. And um, this is at wheel.com slash sketch. And basically, you just let her rip, and there she goes. Uh, let's do a different pattern. It's remembering the last pattern I drew. So uh, there's an eraser, thank goodness. And you can change the colors. And there's um, a, uh, a helpful help menu of shortcuts. Um, and uh, let's just wait here for about an hour, and then we'll see what it comes up with. <laughs> Um, oh, we can run it in fast mode. And then in the course of making this, I had to figure out, you know, how do you see a finished drawing without over cranking it? So in other words, how many times do you have to crank it for the drawing to be finished? Which is an interesting problem that I figured out and I will not tell you the solution for. <laughs> <laughs> but rest assured that I did figure it out and you can figure it out too if you think about it. So, all right. Um, there we go. And so this has a, a few different gear configurations. And then you can, uh, um, you can move the pen arm around and uh, you know, rotate it uh, if I grab it from the right spot. There we go. Um, and move it up and down on the machine and change the size of the gears. And it, it's got a lot of constraints in it to prevent you from doing things that don't work, basically. Um, and it's not truly general purpose. You know, I'm not calculating the friction of the gears against each other and, and doing calculus or anything like that. It's, it's all fairly high level. Um, but there's basically a set of linkages, of object-oriented linkages that know that, you know, a gear of this number of teeth is connected to a gear of this number of teeth. And if I turn this so much, this is going to turn so much in the opposite direction. And the things that are connected to it are going to... So it's just doing that, and uh, it works. Um, so in the, one of the cool things that uh, you can do with this is you can do animations where you produce a finished drawing like that, and take a snapshot, and then you move something, and you do a finished drawing again. Take a snapshot, move it, finished drawing, OK? Um, or move a few things. And so I, I, I put in the ability to essentially set two keyframes of settings and have it tween between them and show you all the finished drawings. 
And um, um, I'll show you one of those. And, and through playing with it, you can, you can learn what effect different gear configurations have, different teeth configurations, different pen arm configurations have. And uh, it's an interesting process to go through. And uh, that's my talk. Oh, by the way, <laughs> that was definitely not 20 minutes. The first one, the first one was probably an hour. And then the last one was like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point of recreational programming is that you believe it's going to be 20 minutes. <laughs>